Hello, so welcome to another book review. This is the book we're going to talk about today. This is Tiger Battalion 507. So the 507th Tiger Battalion which actually gets formed in late 1943 and goes into action on the Eastern Front with Tiger Ones. And then it has a uh, brief operational history on the Western Front from March to April of 1945. Now this is a new book, it's published in May of 2020. Um, edited by Helmut Schneider, who is one of the veterans of the battalion in question. It's an interesting book because um, the story that the editor himself tells is that he gathered some veterans together in the late 1970s, 1980s. And by 1991, they had some uh, veteran accounts from about a dozen veterans, surviving veterans and some photographs and some uh, paid books and, and certifications and stuff like that, which are actually some of which are in, reproduced in the book. And uh, he gets those together in 1991. And then there's a German language uh, version of this book that gets published for some reason much later in 2006. And then this is the first English language uh, version of this comes out uh, May of 2020. So this is the version we're going to look at. Um, edited by the veteran himself, um, uh, Helmut Schneider. So uh, that will be the author that you're looking for. This is published by Greenhill, which is a an imprint of uh, Casemate and Pen and Sword. So they might it might pop up under um, both of those or, or all of those um, uh, publishers. So the publisher, uh, Case 8 uh, and Pen and Sword, are both list listing this book at $32.95, $32.95. Uh, Amazon is listing this at $30.81 for the hardcover. There is a Kindle edition or an ebook which is $6.89, so that's a huge differential from the ebook to the print book. The hardcover, this is the hardcover, this is what it looks like. Um, it's a weighty book. Uh, it's handy, so it's not one of the big uh, Fedorovich um, uh, volumes that you will see, which would be twice as tall as this, which are very common on the German Tiger and heavy assault gun battalions. So it's handy, but it's heavy. There's plenty of content in this, so it's listed at 288 pages. Uh, the dimensions here are 9.5 inches by 6.5. And there's a lot coming in here. So it looks, it, it is packaged. So this size packages as a neat, uh, handy memoir. But the content is typeset with a combination of short anecdotes and um, uh, photographs typeset together, uh, rather like one of the typical large photo books that you would get for, from Fedorovich or, or an expensive publisher like that. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's an outlay. So it's uh, listed at $32.95. It's an outlay. Uh, it's not a trivial outlay, um, but by its size, it's not as expensive as some of those $60, even $80 uh, unit histories that you would typically deal with in first edition. So this is a first English language edition, so you'd expect a premium on that. So uh, it's quite a strange book in, in many ways, and, uh, and that's good and bad. So it's a unique book in the sense uh, that it is a veterans collections, collection of veterans memoirs. And I like that. Uh, there's an authenticity to that. The downside of that is it, it's sometimes quite chaotic. So it, there's, there's an anecdote here and then there's a reproduced um, piece of document or something, and then it jumps to some other anecdote and the timing is lost, so you lose the chronology. So that's uh, sometimes annoying. You have to sort of go back. Sometimes the chronology will change, so the editor will introduce you to a month or two of, of unit operations, and then you get various anecdotes, which are going back in time in the chronology the editor's just described. And then you, you have to piece it together yourself because the, there's no editorial notes to introduce these very quick sections. Um, and so there you've, therefore you, 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 are not, you are not anchored. These sections are not necessarily anchored 
in the timing or the space to make sense of the prior chronology. So a good example is this page. So you've got section, section, section. So here is the editor writing. Uh, and then you've got one of the veterans, a different veteran that the editor has commissioned, who is starting a new section here. And it's not necessarily clear where the new veterans account uh, places in the prior chronology that the editor has, has introduced you to. Um, now, that, that is, a, that is a, a structural problem. However, the quality of the book is very high uh, in terms of text. I'm not going to say the, the typesetting is, is, is commensurate with that. So there, let's, let's look at a few problems in typesetting. This has a photograph which for some reason is stretched across these two pages. So this, would, this is a very interesting photograph. It actually shows many of the new inductees into the unit uh, relaxing in, in, uh, in France um, at the formation of the unit. And there's some, this is a detailed shot that many readers would be interested in, the, the uniforms and uh, what they're doing, their activities. Um, but for some reason, it's stretched across two pages and you lose the, the contiguity of the photograph in this scene here. And then it overlaps one corner of this uh, photograph that's taken probably on the same day at the same French chateau where the uh, inductees are forming. And then there's all this negative space. So in publishing, we call this negative space. It's just wasted space, essentially. That's what that means. So there's no reason to do that. I mean, you could have turned this photograph on its side or you could have fill, infilled with other photographs or with text here. But to split the photograph over two pages, it's uh, just annoying. Um, and that happens a few times. And uh, this typesetting um, disrupts the flow of the text. So here are some prior two pages. We've got text. And we got these two photographs. And then we got more photographs. There's another. Uh, photograph split across two pages. This photograph is another one split across two pages. Uh, and again, a um, lot of negative space. You know, again, split across two pages, a lot of negative space. And so it goes, it goes on, two pages, negative space. Um, <laughs> it keeps going on. Now, yeah, I think it's unfortunate because there are some unique photographs in here for the supplied by the veterans who are writing in this volume itself. So I wanted to be clear about the um, how the, the content is presented before we actually look at the content. Now the content is good quality, right? So you're getting uh, veteran accounts, which I prefer. I prefer. These are primary sources. There's no hearsay in here, so there's nothing um, even where soldiers are talking about what other soldiers are saying. These are direct veteran recollections of what's going on in this unit. Uh, so the unit is formed in the autumn of 1943, it actually goes into action on the Eastern Front in March of 1944, uh, goes straight into action off the, uh, after detraining from the railhead. Now this is an example of the quality of content you will get. These are lovely in-action photographs of this very first battle by the unit. So these are in-action photographs. They are shots taken from the vehicles themselves of other vehicles like this Tiger going across the battlefield. That's what we want to, what we want to see. So we've got uh, in the primary account by veterans. This is how I experienced the, the battle. And these are the photographs by those same veterans. So that's, that's impressive. And then there are the official photographs that happen to be of the same unit, which are utilized in the same account. Veterans photograph, veterans photograph, and then uh, what you see a lot of in this particular book is a series of diary entries where the dozen or so veterans who actually provide almost all the content for this book, including the editor, so the editor is one of the first person contributors, uh, the diary entries, so if, if these veterans are, are writing a diary at the time, what the editor's chosen to do is take an a single day and if any of those veterans wrote anything in their diary for that day, all of those entries are put for that date. So there's good and bad about that. So the, the good of that is that you get the authentic entries for the day in question and, they, and, they, and the diary writers might be talking about the same 
but then you get these authentic direct uh, accounts um, complementing each other about the same event the downside of that is that you yourself as a reader you have to integrate then the knowledge across these different di diary entries where normally a, 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 a historian would quote from those diary entries and make a, a, a seamless account. These are large scale maps um, and what the editor has done is put little tiger tank symbols to show where the unit was operating. Now there's an interesting uh, claim in the preface by the editor but the unit actually never fought as a unit, so at most it's it's fighting as companies, distributed companies. It's never actually fighting as a unit. And towards the end of the war, in fact, there's companies on different Western and East Eastern fronts. So it's it's highly distributed, and that's uh, going to make a lot of problems for recovery and maintenance of the vehicles, particularly in. The yeah. So let's look at this particular anecdote. This is a very sad anecdote. Um, and I've highlighted it because it's not typically going to get into the history books. Uh, and I'm actually surprised that it got into a history of the unit that was written or edited by veterans of the unit itself. So this is uh, Hubert Hagenberger. Um, the section here is my memories, my first operation with Tiger 324. So this is March 1944 when the unit first goes into action. And uh, he's driving a tank that uh, is leading some Panzer Grenadiers and uh, they were receiving artillery fire and they stopped and he, he the driver was expecting to get an order to back up or reverse the tank not knowing that Panzer Grenadiers were sheltering at the rear of the of the tank um, he gets that order to back up very suddenly and the tank runs over, kills two of those Panzer Grenadiers, and there's a grisly description of what that what that realization looks like. I'm going to. I like these photographs. I'm going to show you these ones. This is uh, on the other end of the spectrum. You've got some unusually comic photographs here. So the head of the workshop company is is riding on the front of the Schwimmwagen, and they've got cables connected to this tiger tank and for comic effect they're pretending to pull the tiger tank or uh... now here's an example of something i appreciate in unit memoirs you don't see often references to the workshop or the repair uh, elements of a unit or formation and the germans are unusual in having highly decentralized uh, maintenance and recovery assets to the unit uh, rather than a higher formation like a brigade and so typically when you see memoirs that are edited by a publisher the publisher just wants all those action sequences uh, between tigers and, and tanks so tanks on tanks and there's a neglect of the logistical elements which include the repair and maintenance but here we've got one of the veterans one of the dozen veterans who is regularly quoted here is actually a new workshop company commander and there's various photographs of him and recollections of what it was like um, him learning the trade so there's quite a few anecdotes in this book, book about confrontations between tiger one tanks and joseph soviet joseph stalin two tanks so the unit is not the first unit to meet joseph stalin two tanks uh, but it but it but it quickly comes up later and uh in this particular anecdote um this is by heinz zinker who is a gunner uh, he's going into action in uh, September of 1944 and um, he attacks a village that then is counterattacked by uh, 20, he estimates 20 to 25 Soviet tanks, including some Josef Stalin. So he describes them as very large examples, square brackets of tanks, with a flat semicircular turret and a huge gun. And these are later identified as Josef Stalin twos. And uh, he says, uh, I aimed at these unknown times to disturb their advance in vain. Previously with our eight, eight centimeter gun at this range, we had never had difficulty in doing serious damage, but this time the hits ricocheted off. So he's facing 20 to 25 of mixed types of tanks, probably T-34s with this Joseph Stalin two tanks. It's not specific. He is actually in only two Tiger tanks that are left operating 
Um, not that the others have been knocked out, but they're being recovered. They've been fighting all day. They're being recovered behind him, so he's forming a rear guard with two tanks. Um, and he, he and the other tank hold their own uh, with some anxiety until Stukas show up um, and they save the day. So his quote here, the Stukas had saved us. Our joy was indescribable. And uh, they um, generally get the better of the Joseph Stalin two tanks because the, the explanations that the veterans themselves have is that um, they can fire quicker and they're better trained. Um, and particularly in one instance, they were counterattacked by Joseph Stalin tanks in the fog and in the sudden confrontations between these two tanks, the quicker rate of fire of the Tiger and the better training was marked there was a there was a marked advantage in the fog this is a nice little uh, story here by kirk kramer who is one of those dozen veterans he pops up a lot here uh, he is talking about um, a counterattack in a through a crop of maize like maize or standing corn and he says in a large field of maize two meters tall only the commander could see anything and the quote continues whole regiments could hide themselves in these fields now i selected this particular account because it illustrates how short range the confrontations could be in terrain as close as that so uh, they knock out some soviet assault guns and then they notice a soviet anti-tank gun uh, at very close range less than 50 meters and they're shooting it at each other and eventually the commander says ram it and so they do ram it and they crush it uh, they the soviets get one shot away as the tiger bounds forward at a range of 15 meters and misses and the tiger quote kept rolling and seconds later layman ran uh, layman is the driver rammed the pack barrel pack german for anti-tangum rammed the pack barrel, which contorted and crushed the splayed outriggers. The pack crew fled into the maze. How they had managed to miss us twice at such short range remains a mystery. I'm gonna show you this page. So I mentioned earlier that the veterans um, provide their own accounts, they provide their own photographs, and they provide some documents. This is one um, which I find particularly interesting. So this is the title of the unit's own newspaper. Uh, so the Die Pranke, which means the poor is a stylized image of a tiger and uh, it's subtitled the newspaper of the Viennese tiger battalion and from that newspaper there's actually quotes of the unit's claims so in the first 77 days of operations the unit claimed 252 enemy tanks plus 80 assault guns I'm going to show you these photographs these are interesting so here we have a turretless tiger. So turretless tigers, um, you see a lot of photographs of turretless tigers because uh, the turret is removed to access, particularly the transmission or possibly the traversing gear, although the traversing gear was pretty reliable, the transmission needed more maintenance. So at least to, to remove the transmission, you had to remove the turret. So in a um, major repair, the turret is off and off. So I, I would presume that this tiger is, is in repair. And then it's towing, apparently two tigers in series behind it. I would think that the two tigers behind, they have some power, but for some reason, perhaps they're not producing enough power, maybe they're misfiring. So the unit fights on the Eastern Front almost continuously, almost daily, from March of 1944 to March of 1945. In February, parts of the unit are sent back to um, Western Germany, so actually Senelager, to reform with Tiger II tanks. So they're in Western Germany. They've received their first uh, Tiger II tanks, actually 15 of them, towards late March 1945, and then they're immediately committed. So this, they're put, put in a single company, the third company. Remember, the unit never fights more than one company. company is ordered straight into battle against the Americans with these 15 Tiger II tanks. And that forms the Battle of Paderborn. And I wanted to show you the Battle of Paderborn, including the reformation of this unit, or at least one of the companies with Tiger II tanks, forms a substantial part of the book. So it actually goes from uh, about the 230s 
in the pages to the last pages, 280s. So the final Tiger II is abandoned on the 8th of April. And most of these final pages show photographs of Tiger II tanks that have been abandoned. However, the text is all about the fight for Paderborn. So the unit has a very, uh, uh, the unit makes a very good, strong showing against American tanks in the fight, in the defense of Paderborn, but it's operating without any workshop assets at all. So whenever a one of their Tiger IIs has a mechanical pro problem, it's essentially abandoned. It can't be recovered and it can't be repaired. There are no assets to do it. So it strongly um, knocks back the American armored thrust towards Paderborn, but it's going to lose most of its tanks abandoned. So you've got sort of a disconnect between lots of photographs of these abandoned tanks, and they're beautiful photographs of, of identifiable tanks of the unit, um, but they don't have any relation to the actual fighting for Paderborn, where the claim here is that no Tiger II tanks are lost at all. So the devastation wrought on the US armored column, no Tiger II tank, tanks are lost at all. So it's a bit of a shame there are actually no there's not even photographs of the battlefield itself. That's a shame because the veterans go into a lot of detail about that particular battle. It just goes on for a day. It's, it's only, only essentially a day long. And there's all these pages from different veterans remembering what was going on, including the veteran, the, the editor. Um, but there's no photographs to accompany it. So um, that's a bit of a shame. Now, the reason the, uh, the, the Battle of Paderborn is very well documented is because in the 1980s, the veterans were invited to join a staff ride or a battlefield tour with the US Army on that particular battle. So there were veterans from both sides. So they spoke, they visited, and they wrote up their accounts um, in actually in 1982. And then they end up in this collection that the editor gathered together. So the Battle of Paderborn, that's uh, an interesting one. And it's thorough. And it's a shame, actually, some of the other battles are not as thorough. Um, and it's come, they are in some detail. So, they, so for instance, there's this interesting account of where the Tiger IIs had, uh, they had warning of an armored column trying to get at their rear. So they turn about on a ridge and they destroy that column without loss. Uh, they destroy all the US tanks, their Shermans, except for one which hides behind a barn and one Tiger II goes down the ridge, gets to 30 meters away from the barn, decides which side of the barn it's gonna go. It rushes to the right-hand side with its tr turret traversed to the left, and it's made the right choice, destroys that Sherman. And uh, the veteran who's, who has the account of that, he was watching from the ridge, Kurt Kramer again, who generally has the most valuable accounts in this book, he says, um, between the Caucasus and Paderborn, I cannot ever remember having seen a more courageous individual action. So there it is, Tiger Tank, edited by Helmut Schneider, uh, published uh, May of 2020 by Greenhill, which is uh, associated with Casemate and Pen and Sword, so you'll see it on all of those websites. I recommend this book because of the content. It's all veteran accounts, and mostly veteran photographs and documents. Uh, there are some problems with typesetting, what I mentioned, um, but I think it's a good value for $30. That's the current price on Amazon, hardcover, certainly for less than $7 ebook. This is great value. There's a lot of content in here, um, and it's from direct from the veterans themselves, which you don't often see. So, Tiger Battalion 507, recommended. See you next time.